Boxing fans, we're breaking down Stevenson versus Williams, Santa Cruz versus Frampton, and some breaking news. Stay tuned. You're tuning into the destination for TV superfan discussion, After Buzz TV. And now, let the buzz begin. Welcome to the Boxing After Show here at After Buzz TV. I'm Jared Gilkerson. That's at Gilkerson Radio on Twitter. Andrea Fasano couldn't join us today. She's out on assignment, so it's a solo show. We're live on YouTube right now. I'm in the chat room weighing in on this weekend's fights. I'll be breaking them down. Two fights this past weekend. Actually, three if you look at it, or four or five, or depending on how many undercards you watch. But I'm breaking them all down. Show me your scorecards. I want to know how you scored these fights. One of them was very close. We'll jump into. But before we jump in and breaking them down, Make sure you subscribe to this show, AfterBuzz TV's Boxing After Show on iTunes. We're on SoundCloud. We're on YouTube right now live. And, of course, like us, subscribe, all that stuff on iTunes. That helps us out. That helps me out. That helps keeps me on the air. And it helps keep all of us talking about our favorite sport, boxing. So we can keep talking about it from week to week. We had a very interesting weekend. It actually started early. It started on Friday night with Adonis Stevenson, WBC light heavyweight champion Adonis Stevenson. You remember him. A few years ago, he beat Tavoris Cloud. And if you look at him, you kind of forget what he did. Uh, if you look at his record, uh, you know, the big fight against Chad Dawson, which kind of put him on the map when Emmanuel Stewart was training him. Still some of the best shorts in the game. That gold, cronk, Jim gold. It's just iconic with that gym and it makes me miss Emmanuel Stewart as a trainer and an announcer on HBO um, and those are some of the slickest looking shorts you know I break down you know some of the outfits and robes you know it's aesthetics are a part of athletics so we have to break that down but he was defending his belt he being Adana Stevenson versus Thomas Williams Jr. Friday night on Spike TV that was a PBC show and then Saturday night Leo Santa Cruz and Carl Frampton for the WBO Featherweight Championship. And we're going to break down Adana Stevenson here first and then get to the real show, Santa Cruz. So hang in tight. If you're on the chat on YouTube, hang in. We're going to be breaking that more exciting fight down. But Adana Stevenson, this guy's had the WBC light heavyweight title forever, it feels like. And it also feels like he hasn't defended it against anybody in a long time. His last few opponents before Thomas Williams Jr., Tommy Carpency, who got waxed last week on the undercard of the pay-per-view, Saki Obika, formidable opponent, but not really a light heavyweight, Dimitri Sukotsi, no clue who that is, Andres Fonfara, who, well, we thought was big time, but lost this past weekend, so probably wasn't much of a challenge, Tony Bellew, too busy in Rocky movies, and then you had the Tavoris Cloud and Chad Dawson fights in 2013. We haven't seen him in a marquee fight in three years. He comes out on Spike TV on a Friday night and wipes the floor with Thomas Williams Jr. And at times, in my opinion, didn't look that impressive. Thomas Williams Jr., decent light heavyweight, but nothing to write home about. If you break down the rounds in this fight, uh, if you don't know, Adonis Stevenson won by KO in round four. Uh, quick left hook, beautiful. Great knockout. So if you haven't watched the fight, at least watch the knockout. Thomas just lands head first on the canvas. And Stevenson looked great in the first round. It, and he, not, he knocked down Williams, and it looked like it was going to be a quick night. But Williams adjusted. Williams made a pretty big adjustment in round two. He was tucking his hands by his head. He was staying in the pocket. And he was moving forward and landing the cleaner shots. He was teeing off on Stevenson in the second round. So I gave that round 10-9 for, for Williams. And we go back to round three. Stevenson hurts Williams again. Uh, Williams looked a, a, it, Williams was better when he was not tentative, but also not aggressive. When he was too aggressive, Stevenson could really tee off because he was leaning in. But when he was tentative, Stevenson could still land cleaner shots because you know, Williams is backing up. So he needed to find that in-between, counter his shots, and his defense was really slick, but it just he couldn't keep it up. And Stevenson eventually punched through Williams' guard, 
And by the fourth round, you know, it became a phone booth fight, which is terrible for Williams because Stevenson is just a powerful, powerful fighter. And, you know, there are trading punches on the, on the, on the inside. And eventually Stevenson lands that quick left hook into the night for Williams. Valiant effort by Williams. I got to give it up. Williams really showed a lot of effort. And he wasn't just going in there to collect a paycheck and say that he fought for a title. He went in there, tried to win, changed up his game plan. It worked for a small portion of time. Then he got smashed by a really, really, really good light heavyweight. I thought this was odd. And I'm not sure if the fans watching thought this was odd as well. So at the end of the fight... Um, it's weird. Pro Boxing Championship, the PBC has created this bubble, and, and all boxing promotions and, and networks do. HBO has got their bubble of fighters, Showtime, PBC is, is now on NBC and CBS and Spike, and they're everywhere. But the interviewer, I forget his name, walks up to Adonis and, you know, slaps him five like they're buddies. And it's weird to see that in a sport where you know, usually most announcers are supposed to toe that line of not saying who they're rooting for. They're obviously rooting for Stevenson because he's the moneymaker. But it's a little unsettling to see someone, to see that happen because you see this buddy buddiness. Uh, and it, it, it just, it just, it, it, I don't know. I think pro boxing championships is in just a little too much in their own heads. They're always matching up just their guys. Uh, their pool of guys isn't that big. Um, I think they think that their promotion is bigger and better. And Adonis Stevenson hasn't fought anyone. The WBC title is usually looked at as the most prestigious title in boxing. But Sergey Kovalev and Andre Ward are looked at as the, the two best in that division, and they should. Kovalev, for sure, Ward just came up. But Ward's track record is is amazing. But Kovalev should be. The guy's been fighting consistently. Has almost every belt except for the WBC. But Stevenson, it still boggles my mind because I don't have the information. The fans don't have the information on why he's not fighting the best in the sport. And in November 2015, just last fall, you know, Ring Magazine said, we're not going to recognize this guy as a champion because he hasn't fought, you know, a top-ranked opponent in the last two years. So Ring Magazine, who I value, who I look at for rankings more than the belts, stripped him. And they should have. They said, we don't, we're not going to recognize you as the ring champ. And then he comes out and fights Thomas Williams Jr. No offense to Thomas Williams. He took the challenge. But you look at the light heavyweight rankings, you know, Sergey Kovalev is number one on, on my list. Andre Ward is fighting next week. And then if him and Kovalev will fight in the fall. Then who knows what Bernard Hopkins is doing. He's you know, pushing 55 by now. I mean, not, not quite. And then you have guys like Joe Smith and Isaac Chalimba and Jurgen Brommer and, you know, Alvarez and all these guys that are, that are in the top 10. But, you know, Stevenson's not even fighting them. So it's really frustrating because I really think Stevenson has the talent, but I think his management, they're not pushing for these big fights. And Stevenson isn't young. He's 38 years old, but he still looks really good. His power is maybe unmatched in the division. So it's frustrating as a fan to watch to watch such a good fighter just fight average competition for three years. When he won against Cloud and, and Dawson three years ago, he's 35, you're thinking, cool, maybe he's got a few years to show off his skills. Hopefully the skills don't diminish, and hopefully they give him the challenges. But uh, looking ahead for, for Stevenson, you know, he said publicly he wants to fight Kovalev and um, and I'll talk about in the news a little later who wants to fight Stevenson, who's come out in the news and says he wants to fight Stevenson. I'll tease that. But the light heavyweights, are they look pretty good. There's a lot of really good fighters, but you have to start fighting each other. And Stevenson's been in this relative, just he's been in obscurity, and he's the WBC champ. If you're the WBC champ, you can't be uh, just not known, especially coming out of that gym, trained by Emmanuel Stewart and the Kronk gym. This guy's got skills, and he's proved it again, but he's got to fight top five, top ten guys. The best. We want to see the best. And that's what Kovalev and Ward are going to be doing. So it would be nice, contracts aside, with networks, if we could see the Kovalev and Ward winner fight against Stevenson. That's what I wish.
pipe dream maybe that's what being a boxing fan is like a lot of times you're not going to see the best but you will see some of the best fights which is the next one we're talking about because we got to jump into this showtime put on a hell of a show last night one of their best shows in a while you had wba featherweight champion leo santa cruz mr over thousand punches every fight this guy is magnetic he's great to watch and as we'll roll the highlights here in a, in a, in a minute, uh, this fight went the distance if you didn't hear about it. And actually, Zach, let's just roll in those highlights and we'll, and we'll talk about the fight. So as you wa if you're watching live on YouTube, this fight, the exchanges in this fight were, were amazing because when the fighters did fight on the inside, Frampton was much more accurate, much more preci precise, and in my opinion, had heavier hands, more powerful punches. Santa Cruz looked off balance at times, and it looked like his punches weren't carrying as much weight. And as we find out later on, Santa Cruz ended up throwing about 400 more punches, but Frampton, if I look at my numbers correctly, Frampton ended up landing only 13 less punches, and he threw 350 less. So Frampton was very accurate. I mean, but this is an exciting fight for 12 rounds straight as we watch the ending and the announcement. New WBA featherweight champion, Carl Frampton from Northern Ireland, ecstatic because he's the first Northern, Northern Islander to win in two different weight classes. He won at the 122 pound weight class and now 126, really impressive. Really, really impressive uh, by Carl Frampton. He now goes to 23-0. and 0, And I had this fight even after six rounds. It was, it was a really hard uh, fight to score, and I want to hear from the fans and how they had it. Uh, my final scorecard was 115-113 for Frampton. Uh, the rest of the judges, 114-114 draw, 116-112, and 117-111. I'm actually fine with all of those scores because so many of these rounds were close. If, if I look back at my notes um, and you look at everything as a whole, there were times when Carl Frampton it looked like he was taking too long of a period off. He would take, you know, 30 seconds off as Santa Cruz would get a few jabs in, get a few body shots. Maybe they'd fight inside and Santa Cruz would land a few more. And those are the rounds that, that Santa Cruz won, obviously. Um, round two was, was exciting because Frampton actually staggered Santa Cruz and he, the rope saved him from falling over. Uh, that was the only close knockout in the fight. But Frampton's body work and, and his head movement and his footwork, he put himself in position where I think it confused Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz is, is used to just teeing off you know, 1,100, 1,200 punches, landing 40% winning rounds on just pure activity. Uh, he's usually a little more accurate, but Frampton showed that, hey, if I move my head and I move my feet, and you're not going to be able to catch me with all those shots. And you look at the final numbers, you know, Santa Cruz landed 25% of his shots, 255 of 1,002 punches. Frampton, 242 of 668. Um, so after six, I had it even, but then I had Frampton rolling off seven, eight, 11, yeah, no, 7, 8, 9, and 11 uh, to kind of close the fight strong. Um, but I love to see this rematch. This, this, is a, this is a great fight because this had a combination of inside fighting where there's no defense at times, and then times where you see two skilled boxers teeing off more Frampton than Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz has never been a great defensive fighter. It's never had to be. Frampton's defense was pretty impressive to make Santa Cruz look average, decent. So f what does this mean now? Because it's amazing. Boxing has is so far away from the heavyweights, even though that's where a lot of us became fans. I mean, I'm 32 years old. I became a fan in the 90s. Heavyweights were something. But right now, anywhere from 122 to 175, is really really exciting but 122 to 1 you know 60 147 is just 
packed with talent. So if you look now at the featherweight division, Gary Russell Jr. still WBC champ. Leo Santa Cruz lost his title to Frampton. And I really like Carl Frampton. He is short, but he proved that that didn't matter in this fight. He's short, but his defense and his footwork and his head movement is, is, is great. And I think if you match him up against anyone else in that 126 weight class, Gary Russell Jr., Abner Marez, you know, Oscar Valdez, there's a lot of, lot of players here. I think he's got the skill to, to defend the title against anyone there. Now, it's a matter of does he want to go back down to 122 because there's a lot of people there like Guillermo Rigondeaux wants a piece of that. Um, Quig, I bet, wants it again, but no one wants to see Quig Frampton again. Um, Donaire is still around. Or does he risk going up to 130, which is junior lightweight? Because you've got Francisco Vargas, you've got Orlando Salido, you've got Vasily Lomachenko, you've got T Takashi Miura. There's a lot of names. But can he go up to 130? Will his power go up to 130? I'm not sure. He looks a little small. But let's revel in the fact that he just took Leo Santa Cruz to school and is now the 126-pound champion. Really impressive. Quote of the night last night was asking... You know what this means to him being the first Northern Ireland or Northern Ireland two-time champion, two-way division champion. And his answer was, hopefully I don't have to buy a pint for the next 20 years. That's why people love the fans love these the some of these European fighters, the the guys from England and Ireland and Scotland and the rabid fan base. They're so loud during the fights. I mean, the fight was in New York. Leo Santa Cruz is from the United States, albeit California, but the fans from Ireland were louder than the fans that Sa Santa Cruz had there from California or Mexico. And that says something. These fans travel. They make the, the atmosphere so exciting. And that might have helped Frampton. You know, he's in there. He feels like he's in a, in a home fight. Um, but these... The attitude, I just love the attitude because a lot of times in these fighters you get the, you know, it's a good fight and uh, we'll see what we do next and we'll see what my team wants to do. This guy's talking about getting beers bought for him for the next two decades. So I just love the attitude. It's just like the let's drink, let's fight, let's have a good time, uh, and it works for him and it works for his fan base. So uh, I would love to go to a fight uh, in New York or overseas and, and enjoy that, or even in Vegas, because they've traveled well to Vegas. I, I really hope Frampton can can bring that kind of fan base to Vegas. And I think after a performance like this, I think he can. I think he can take his fans to the West Coast and liven up those arenas in Vegas, uh, which always makes for a stellar evening of boxing. So props to Carl Frampton going up four pounds and taking care of business in 126. So that's that. We've got some breaking news today. We've got some news to talk about. Let's, let's get into it. So after all of these, this fallout from this weekend, Santa Cruz, Frampton, Stevenson, Kovalev talk, Ward talk, there's all these big fights coming up. There it is. I love it. What I didn't talk about was Mikey Garcia is back. If you didn't watch the undercard of Santa Cruz and Frampton, Mikey Garcia got the knockout. He has come out today and says he wants to fight lightweight titleist Flanagan next. Mikey Garcia is really impressive. The guy was out for two years, and now he's back. And our, I think it was about two and a half years. If I look at his box rec here, Mikey Garcia, last fight was January of 14. Now, it, yeah, so it was two and a half years, and he's 35-0, and 0, still looks sharp. So let's get him in a title match quickly, can we? Because uh, the, guy is, the guy is precise. He's very Vasily Lomachenko-ish. Um, and, and now that I mentioned that name, let's match those two up. That would be a great fight. 
Um, some Roger Mayweather news. Uh, he had Roger Mayweather was reported missing a few days ago, but good news, uh, he was found safe. No health concerns there. So if you love Roger Mayweather and the Mayweather family, there's good news there. Nothing happened to him. Uh, Pauly Malignaggi's in the news. He was on the undercard this past weekend on Showtime and then went to announce. So I give props to anyone who can get punched in the face and then come out and announce later on. Uh, he said he's going to take a vacation and consider his career. Pauly now... Um, He's doing something kind of interesting. He's not hanging around like some old fighters do and, and think they have a shot. I think Pauling knows that he might not have a shot at some of these bigger titles, but he's fighting locally in New York and New Jersey because he's well-known there and he's well-liked. And love him or hate him, the guy uh, has a following and appeases that fan base. And, and he's still making money. And I think he can win some of those you know New York and New Jersey titles, those local titles, and, can, and fight there and... Why not? Just keep doing that. The guy's still entertaining. So let him go for it. Um, Ruslan Chagayev retires from boxing. Remember him? Um, Shannon Briggs was trying to chase David Hay at the Barclays Center. Remember Shannon Briggs? Shannon the Cannon Briggs. He still wants title shots at the heavyweight division. Uh, if you haven't uh, checked him out on Twitter, check out Shannon Briggs on Twitter. It's actually one of the more entertaining or annoying, whichever way you want to look at it, Twitter follows. Uh, Guillermo Rigondeaux calls out Carl Frampton. I'm not sure if Frampton's going to go for that. Uh, it won't. That fight won't be nearly as exciting as the Santa Cruz fight. Uh, but, hey, that would be um, an, another notch if, if Frampton can, can run through Rigondeau. But that won't be easy because Rigondeau, very defensive, hard to catch. Uh, might not be the most exciting fight, but that could be happening. Um, Demetrius Andrade is going to return in October to Showtime. Um there's also news about Santa Cruz and Frampton. No Santa Cruz and Frampton rematch clause, uh, but Lou, uh, DiBella expects a sequel, and, and so do I. Uh, I think the sequel's got a chance to make money. I think it's got a chance to happen in Belfast. Um, Santa Cruz said he wants to fight in Los Angeles, but now that you don't have the belt, I think Frampton's going to call the shots, and I think that fight might happen overseas at some point in, in the future. Um and Freddie Roach has come out. Recently, Freddie Roach said that um, he's, I don't think he's that comfortable having Pacquiao in the ring with uh, Terrence Crawford this soon. I think he wants a tune-up fight. I don't think it's up to Freddie Roach. I think it's up to Pacquiao's management, not his trainer. Um, and Freddie Roach recently said that uh, he, he talked to Mayweather, and Mayweather hasn't trained since retiring. So take that however you which way you want it. Um, cause I know they all want to rematch with, with Mayweather, but you know, Mayweather has shown really no interest in coming back, but like Roy Jones says, his name is money Mayweather, money Mayweather. So no matter what, I think he's not done. That's our prediction here at the after buzz TV boxing after show that Mayweather is not done. I think he's got at least one more fight and that's all we have for the news today. Now we jump into my favorite segment of the week. We're talking this day in boxing history. And we got to go back to July 31st, 1982. Alexis Arguello versus Kevin Rooney. This is, if I do my math correctly, 34 years ago. Zach, let's cue up that Alexis Arguello fight from 34 years ago um, as, as Zach is doing that and queuing up the fight for us here. Um, Alexis Arguello is, is looked at as one of the best featherweights in the history of the game. And you look at his numbers, you know, all time, and he's 77 and 8. Um, the, the guy was... So many fighters like to mirror their career off of his, and He's influenced a few fighters that are currently in the game. But let's go back to July 31st, 1982, uh, in his fight against Kevin Rooney. This is round two. And watch out for this quick hook. Look at that shot. Right hand. And Kevin Rooney has no shot. Rooney had, yeah. And that's it. A round KO. First man over to see Kevin Rooney yep. 
Yeah, and a class act there by Alexis Arguello coming over. Um, this was an interesting fight if you look at how these careers, um, the careers went for each guy. And if you're wondering, I looked at Kevin Rooney, and you know, I, this fight was before I was born, but I looked at Kevin Rooney, I'm like, that guy looks really familiar. And, of course, he went on to train uh, in Customato's crew and helped train Mike Tyson in the 80s. And he was on that crew for a while, so I knew his face looked familiar. And then, of course, Alexis Arguello went on. Um, you know, he'd won 18 consecutive fights, you know, at that point. And, and he was moving up to, to 140 to fight Rooney in one. Um, this was actually both of these fighters' first time fighting at 140. Rooney was a class above. He dropped down. Arguello, class below, he goes up, and don't you know that sometimes you think that power is not going to translate into other weight classes? We saw that today. Carl Frampton's power went up to the next weight class, looked great. Alexis Arguello did it 34 years ago, went up to the next weight class, looked great. Um, of course, Arguello, uh, this was after his long streaks in the 70s and earlier in the 80s where he had great streaks at, at, at featherweight, and then super featherweight, and he had his uh, eventually fighting um, Aaron Pryor, which was his kind of his last big fight, fighting Aaron Pryor for the uh, super lightweight title in 1983 and losing by knockout. He fought a few more times in the 80s and then a few more times in the 90s, sprinkled in there like all boxing records. You see it that uh, sometimes guys go away and come back in you know six, seven, eight years. Sometimes they succeed, but most of the time they don't fighting journeyman but we're talking featherweights today on the showtime car with santa cruz and frampton so what better place to have the this day in boxing history 1982 july 31st alexis arguello check out the fight okay it's only five minutes on youtube check it out and become familiar with alexis arguello because anyone who fights 85 times in their career you got to give props to it and this is my last point look at these guys records if you just look at 1980 alone he fought in january march april august november five fights in the prime of his career in one in, in one year you're lucky to get you're lucky to get three out of a guy it basically has to happen in january then the summer then the fall it's usually just two for the big names now i'm not sure if that's the healthiest but maybe we can find a middle ground instead of just having one or two fights a year I'd like to see these guys fight three. Give me three fights a year. Give me three fights for all these champions, um, especially if you run over someone, especially if you – someone like Adonis Stevenson. I think I got tagged a few times, but he could fight in three more months. Uh, he should be fighting in the fall. Stevenson should be fighting a big-name contender in the fall. Okay, Put Chalimba in there with Stevenson. Let's make that happen. Chalimba can sign with PBC and make a great fight. Um, that's it for me here by myself in the studio. It's my studio today. We'll be back next week. We can't wait. Next week, Andre Ward versus Alexander Brand. Now, I don't see Alexander Brand upsetting Andre Ward, but we have a special guest next week. Alan Swire, the El Boxeo director. It's This is going to be great because we have a special guest who made a tremendous boxing film, boxing documentary. He's going to be hanging out with me watching Andre Ward before, before we come in the studio. And then he's coming in. He's going to help us break down the fight. And then we're going to talk about his film, talk about what he's working on, and then talk about some breaking news. A boxing expert in the studio next week, Alan Swire. Uh, can't wait. So until then, I'm Jared Gilkerson. That's at Gilkerson Radio on Twitter. Until next week, we'll see you all later. From executive producers Maria Menounos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, and the entire AfterBuzz TV staff, we would like to thank you for listening to the AfterBuzz TV network. To watch or listen to other After shows and post comments or questions, be sure to visit AfterBuzzTV.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been a presentation of AfterBuzz TV. Box, see you later. The views expressed herein are those of the host only and do not necessarily reflect the views of AfterBuzz TV or its owners or principals.